Here we go. Welcome, welcome one and all. Class number five, uh, Buddhist psychology. So um, let's see, um, we are, let's see, last uh, a couple of weeks I've been looking at kind of having this conversation on these three levels of kind of the traditional old school, early Theravadan Buddhist, uh, a little bit more of contemporary um, kind of clinical application and then, you know, the, the stringent strict through the Abhidhamic lens. So um, today I want to, I guess, pull back a little bit and just kind of lean a little bit more into, I guess, the, the traditional early Buddhist slash kind of contemporary uh, practice oriented secular Dharma uh, lens as we go into these, um, uh, um, uh, 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 what we're going to be talking about today. That's the word that I'm looking for. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into the blackboard, shall we? Where is it? It is, oh, there we go. It is here. Huzzah! Go to psychology, 506. It's official. It has a logo. All right, let's get into things. So um, let's see, um, huh, what I'm looking at here. Okay, so this is what we're gonna be looking at uh, through this traditional kind of secular Dharma. We're gonna be looking at, well, I don't have it here, uh, karma and rebirth, yeah? Uh, so these are things that are, are people find to be scary, especially if people are of more the, how should we say, uh, secular orientation of, of things. Uh, these are the things when you when uh, you're in a, a secular setting or if going into um, how should we say um, uh, uh, um, you know more secular mindfulness um, classes, you know this is these are the things that that smack of religiosity that they don't want people to talk about. And um, again, I go back to this idea that, Although John Kabat-Zinn did an amazing huge service to be able to bring mindfulness into you know, the contemporary setting so that it is enjoying the spotlight that it is currently having for the last, what, two decades? You know? And it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Um, so that's, it's amazing. I mean, he was able to take uh, parts of the Dharma and, and kind of you know stuff it in his shirt and kind of sneak it uh, uh, under the the past the the borders of the medical model and insert it into um, you know medical cl clinical settings uh, education settings and and so on. Um, so uh, that's amazing. Uh, where I think that there is opportunity for growth for sure is well you know where mindfulness was kind of taken out and is able to kind of uh, uh, interact with society, it seems as though it was kind of like a rather, like they took this whole ball of the Dharma and kind of just kind of pulled out this little piece of mindfulness and just kind of cut arbitrarily and just said, here, this is mindfulness. And, and by not having it connect with the, the larger theoretical system, um, I think is, well, it, it serves to, to, to limit the, the potential of, of mindfulness. So part of my interest is how is it that we can reaffirm, reconnect uh, kind of this contemporary secular view of mindfulness back to the original system and not have it be something that well, freaks people out, so to speak. So uh, last week um, I, I, I deconstructed the phrase um, liberation from samsaric rebirth, yeah? In terms of looking really at the definitions of all these phrases uh, for it to be somewhat, mm, you know, reorganized in a way or, or, or translated in a way where, you know, we're looking for a liberation or a breaking of bonds of our deeply ingrained um, habits of discontent uh, that we're shackled to. And if we can, um, you know, let go of these patterns that show up in this repetitive way, um, then boy, doesn't that uh, uh, create a, a sense of, of lightness, of well-being, of having a sense of agency choice within our lives. You know, I don't think that anybody can argue that that's a bad thing. So 
uh, in that spirit, let's go into looking at these uh, ideas of karma and rebirth. So the takeaway message that I want to, to um, I guess, emphasize today or go back to is let's not look at rebirth as literally reincarnation. You know, I'm not saying that that's totally not what it is. Um, oftentimes in the Dharma, Buddha talks about these things on, that can be applied in different levels, you know, and in different circumstances may mean different things. So rebirth, uh, it can mean kind of, well, have different definitions. The way that I would like to look at rebirth today is not in terms of the literal reincarnation, there was an entity uh, of me that existed before this human form, and I will be re uh, reincarnated again into another form after this form dies. That's not the, the particular strand of conversation I'm interested in having today. But I'm looking, I want to look at the sense of rebirth as how we are coming into each moment anew. Yeah. Uh, let's for a moment disregard the self bor uh, born according to the information on our birth certificate. Yeah. But look at this idea of birth as how we construct each moment in consciousness. Yeah. So in, in, in each moment that arises, um, all of these systems of, of this mind body process are uh, taking in sensory information interpreting it, processing it, so that we can have some continuity of experience of a, 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 a continuous um, sense of me experiencing this continuity of this world, yeah? But that's something that's being created in each moment, yeah? Each moment we're entering into a, a new. So part of the present time awareness uh, of mindfulness is looking at, um, well, uh, how the moment is born and how this sense of I am is born as well. Yeah? So this idea of I am in each moment shifts and changes depending on what information, what sensory data comes to us, how we uh, uh, contact it, how it might begin to uh, connect with and elicit certain kind of underlying uh, sankharas, uh, underlying habit patterns of perception and such. And then boom, you know, what happens there? Yeah. So as we're, we're as as I'm talking, I'm talking about this process, this process of action that gives rise to a sense of I am. So this idea of action and selfing coming together. So that's what I want to look at uh, with this theme of karma and rebirth. Yeah. So uh, again, a little bit of a reminder back to class one, you know, at the heart of the Abhidhamma analysis, the scrutiny of phenomena of reality by breaking it down into its subcomponent parts. And the synthesis, examining the interdependent nature of causality and conditionality. I'm going back to that because, yeah, that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be scrutinizing the phenomena, look at conditionality, and how this creates a self in each moment. What conditions are creating a self, the sense of I am? So part one, karma. Uh, we'll look at dependent origination a little bit, and then we'll go back into, into karma. But I'd like to, um, again, uh, referencing this book right here, uh, Beth Jacobs, the original Buddhist psychology. She says on page 110, karma literally means action, but it is used in the sense of volitional action. Volition is defined as the act or exercise of willing, but doesn't necessarily mean a planned behavior. The action of karma is the directional, hmm, chagrin, I think that's a little autocorrect. The, the, uh, the directional, how should we say, charge. Any, uh, ah, ah, my autocorrect was on, uh, on a turbo charge today. So the action of karma is the directional charge of any act of perception, uh, the uh, alive vector of human consciousness. Volition is a universal mental factor, uh, introducing a bit of karma into every tiny bit, uh, every tiny instance of wholesome and unwholesome consciousness. Yeah. So um, there's action, but there's a sense of a volition behind an action. So this is what we're, this is a very important part. Um, what is the intention behind the action? Yeah. 
So it's like um, we can look at certain acts and maybe the same act might not necessarily have a karmic charge to it as, as others. Let's just say um, I'm walking and I'm looking up at the sun and it's beautiful and it warms my heart, but I'm not paying attention and I step on an ant. Well, you know, what kind of karma is that produced? You know? Versus stage two, I'm walking and I'm looking at the sidewalk and I see an ant and I'm filled with disgust and dismay and hatred. And I pick up my foot and I stamp on it and relish the experience of expunging that ant's life. What kind of karmic charge does that have? Two similar acts, the stepping on the ant, but what's being conditioned in the heart? What's being conditioned in the mind, yeah? So we're going into this idea of the intent, there's an intention, the action, and the fruit. So let's look at, it. the action is not just the doing, but it's what happens before and after as well. So there's this uh, analogy of the football, please excuse the sports analogy, um, but here we have this three stage. There's the volition. What's the intention? What is going on in the mind and body prior to engaging in the act itself? You know? So it's like, here we are in the past and we throw something out. And then that act of throwing is the, whatever that act is. And then in the future, we catch it. And then it, there's some sort of fruit or effect that happens. Now then, um, you know, in, in that instance of I'm walking down the street and I'm looking at the lovely sunrise and I step on the ant and I'm not even aware of it. Well, what is that doing? What was I doing? I was cultivating a, a joy and appreciation. Maybe I was cultivating also a little bit of unconsciousness and not being aware of how my actions were affecting the world. So a little positive, a little negative. The second scenario of stepping on the ant, I was suspending my capacity for compassion. I was suspending uh, um, being aware of life and I was giving the green light to my underlying ill will, hatred, disgust. And I was allowing that to proliferate and take charge of you know, uh, directing my actions. Yeah? So there's something that was then reinforced there. So, there's something to be said about like the, the habit patterns that, that can um, occur. Yeah. So um, there can be, uh, uh, you know, if, if we look at other experiences that we have in life, like let's just say um, I have a particular avoidance tendency. Um, you know, I, I, I have a, a significant to-do list I look at the to-do list, it's filled with a whole bunch of things that makes me feel uncomfortable. I gotta make a particularly uncomfortable phone call that I don't wanna do afterwards. There's this bunch of paperwork that's just so impossible and I feel rather unsure of how to go about doing it, yeah? So then there's this, oh, well, let me just check uh, on my phone and I'll just kind of scroll through Reddit for about 30 minutes. And, oh, let me just check on the, you know, what else other tabs I got open on on, uh, on, on Chrome here. And, oh, look, there's this thing on Netflix I didn't finish watching last night. I think I'm just going to do that. And then here I am at five o'clock and I didn't get anything done. Uh, I missed the opportunities to do the work. Yeah, so and I'm feeling bad about myself. Yeah. So in that action there, the intention was what? Well, I have a lot of stuff to do, but what did I give rise to? What did I green light? This underlying habit of avoidance, yeah? this underlying habit of let me, let me uh, lean into entertainment and uh, stimulation seeking instead, because there's something comfortable in that. And then also the habit pattern of wanting to go unconscious into that. And then I just kind of rest within that act for, you know, however many hours pass by. Then the end of the day, that act is done. And what's the fruit? The fruit of that is now I feel bad about myself. It reaffirms beliefs of not being able to, you know, be effective, of uh, reaffirms all of those fears of I can't do it. Yeah. So all of that has now been reaffirmed. Those, those habit patterns of belief are now stronger. Yeah, so that's this idea of volition, the act, and then what we receive. Yeah, so we can look at it in terms of, of lots of different things from, from that 
that type of you know behavior patterns there to like more um, uh, uh, you know destructive addict addictive patterns uh, to just subtle perceptions as well. Uh, I believe in in uh, Beth Jacobs' book, uh, she talks about just the patterns of of um, perception. I, I believe. Uh, scenario she gives is let's say somebody has a particular trauma that they live with and they're they're going down the street they hear some sort of uh, noise on the street and that elicits this uh, trauma related schema of i'm not safe and then you know maybe there's no action that happens but it it it, it potentiates it validates it reaffirms this uprising of this fear and this belief of self and world yeah then in the next moment, they might see children walking through a crosswalk and they're laughing and giggling. And then that kind of perception and schema goes away. And then this different one comes up of, oh, childlike innocence and, and humor. And that, that sense of the world being unsafe goes away. And a new schema of, oh, there's innocence and wonder in the world comes up. So even though there's no act or doing, it's a subtle way that we might be reaffirming a perception or a belief. And we can look at how each one of those experiences, there's a different, deeply different experience of I am within that. You know, in one moment, there's that I'm identified with the trauma and the underlying schema or negative cognition of the world is not safe, I'm not safe. You know, I'm feeling threat and fear. There's a whole kind of personality structure that can be organized around that. The next moment, oh, see the laughing children and such, that falls away, and this other kind of personality pops up. This other little petite ego state of joy and laughter and wonder and safety and enjoyment comes up. Yeah? So this is what I want to look at in terms of this idea of rebirth. You know, why is it that, that one comes up? So in this case, you know, we were looking at last week, the idea of the sense impressions and the sensory impact or the sensory imprints, you know, so we could have the particular experiences that create these deep beliefs, these deep schemas, yeah? That then creates the potential for that particular self associated with that to continue to arise again and again, or be reborn. Yeah. So this is something that, um, you know, we're looking at this idea of, of karma and rebirth together, how certain actions, whether they are um, uh, uh, intentional, consciously intentional or not, that tend to come up, that tend to reaffirm who it is that shows up. So it's the karma, and the rebirth uh, working together. Yeah. Okay. Going back to the blackboard there. Okay. So, um, so this idea of this rebirthing of self. So, again, uh, as usual. Um, for those of you who have sat through uh, this talk of mine, uh, you can reflect upon uh, how your wisdom and depth of understanding has grown since last time we had this conversation. Um, uh, this is uh, one that I frequently have uh, because of the fact that it is, how shall we say, important. Uh, Majma Nakaya 1, 190, Buddha states, one who sees dependent origination sees the Dharma one who sees the Dharma sees dependent origination. So we're going back to this idea in Abhidhamma of analysis and synthesis. Analysis, can we break down the subcomponents of this of, of self and world? Then the synthesis, can we see how, you know, there's this interdependence that is occurring at all times that's giving rise to this sense of self and world. So without further ado, uh, I apologize on the front end because this is a dense one, but I got faith in y'all. Y'all are some smart cookies. So dependent origination, 12 links uh, classically. Uh, they are um, ignorance, sense impressions, avijja sankara. We talked about this one last week, yeah? Anybody remember avijja, ignorance? Yeah. Sankara, the, the, the mental formations that arise um, that are also related to habits, uh, habits of perception, habits of behavior, and they're deeper, deeply latent um, uh, 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 sense impressions that can arise rather spontaneously. 
And when you know there's that potential of them arising with ignorance, we're not seeing them for what they are, then that's the sense of these uh, uh, things kind of subtly taking the wheel without our noticing and driving um, uh, distorting perception and driving behavior. So we have these guys are linked together with this pink line. They're in their own section here. Then in this uh, dark blue here, we have this section. Consciousness, mind and body, the six senses, contact and feel tone. Yeah. So we can look at this in a way as though it's kind of like the, the aggregates. We talk about the aggregates or these sub a particular way of looking at the subcomponents of self. This is another way of looking at the aggregates, but almost in a sequential processing way, almost in a linear way. That'll make sense in a moment. Over here, we have tanha or thirst, clinging, becoming birth, then dukkha, yeah, the suffering that arises. So, praticca samutpada, that's the Pali term. So going into it a little bit more uh, detailed. So avijja sankara, why are they problematic? Well, they're the latent bugs within the system, yeah? Uh, and, and let me phrase this again. Looking at a potential rebirth of a self that's organized around a suffering or organized around a, a particular pattern of discontent, this is what I'm focusing on. And this is the lens that I'm, I'm looking at this through. So... Um, there's this term, the asavas, or meaning the influx cankers. Uh, they're the habits that are in waiting, yeah? So we have a bunch of habits. Some are good, some are bad, you know? Uh, I've gotten pretty good over the years of just uh, uh, flossing, whereas that might have been problematic at a certain point. So now I don't think about it. The flossing just happens if I have the floss around. But I'm not flossing right now. Uh, the camera's off, but you can trust me, I'm not flossing. Uh, but we all have all kinds of habits inside of us that haven't been triggered or not called into being, yeah? So when we look at like the negative ones, the negative habits that are just in waiting, waiting for the right, right things to happen in order for those seeds to take root, yeah? So now we can look at this here as the, the human experience, the aggregates. Do I go more into this? Yes. So consciousness. Let's not get too, too overly complex about it. This is, is the awakeness, the aliveness uh, within us, uh, that sense of being awake and alive. And that further individuates into, well, the mind has its way of having that consciousness. The body has its way of it being in the consciousness. If we further individuate that, we have the six senses. We have the seeing, the hearing, the feeling, you know? A tasting, smell, and within a uh, Buddhist view, mind is also a sense because it's a way in which we contact things. I can contact my cup by touching it, by tasting it. Uh, when I put it up to my lips, I can see it. There's ways I can contact it, but I could also contact the cup by closing my eyes and thinking about it. And sometimes, uh, you know, what is that uh, Mark Twain um, quote, I've suffered a lot in my life, uh, most of which never happened, you know? So a lot of the, the suffering that we go through is within our mental experience. So uh, it, it has an impact on us, yeah? So the six senses and this consciousness individuates as the seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, or mind makes contact with something. Pasa is the Pali term. What are you in contact with in each moment? What is it that you're hearing in this moment? Does that then elicit an emotion within the body? Are you in contact with that? Does that then go through the Rolodex of your mind that pulls up an associated memory? Yeah, moment by moment, we're in contact. Every time we're in contact with something, subtly or not so subtly, there's a feeling tone. Something's pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Yeah. So this is a way in which there's the, the Buddhist concept of we can just be hanging out in the senses you know, if we're meditating and we're, we're cruising along and things are going well, this is pretty much our experience. You know, the seeing, the hearing, the feeling, you know, maybe these other things too. We're in contact with one and another. Maybe it's pleasant, maybe it's unpleasant, but we're just in that sensory experience. Now then this red zone here, this is when we get caught. This is when we get hooked, yeah? So this is where things get a little complex here. I put a little fence here because sometimes we can contact something and then boom, well, that's pleasant. Maybe that triggers a little bit of craving. Yeah? Tanha, meaning thirst. Sometimes people look at it as the term of craving, but 
you know, I like to extend it because the pleasant can lead to craving. Oh, I like that. So I have a little more of that. Then the unpleasant, well, that can give rise to some aversion. Oh my God, I hate that. Oh, get that out of here. I can't stand it. And then the neutral, well, sometimes that could make us go unconscious. Oh, that's neutral. I don't have to pay attention to it. I'm going to zone out, dissociate for a bit. Yeah. So I have this little fence here because we can, we can contact the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, but how do we hang out with it? Do we say, oh, that's interesting, let it go and then hang back in the senses? Or do we fall over to this side of the fence towards rebirth? You know, that craving, the aversion, that unconsciousness, then that starts to kind of go over here and trigger the avijja sankara. And, and it, you know, maybe that's triggering a latent underlying habit pattern of perception, of seeing, of understanding, maybe of behavior, yeah? Little later on, you know, then we're clinging. There's that idea of like, ah, I just can't put that idea down now, you know? So whatever I was doing five minutes before, I've let go of this moment by moment, just all of my conscious attention or unconscious attention is starting to fixate, cling around this, whatever it is I'm connected with. Uh, become fixated, become a little more compulsive, a little more reactive, increased rumination about it, yeah? And when we're in meditation, there's that idea, and it comes and goes, and then another idea comes up, and it's like, oh, that's a good idea. I can't put that one down, you yeah? know? Clinging, and there's becoming, you know? We're crossing the Rubicon. At this point, it's we're going through the birth canal, so to speak, and then boom, birth. And whether that's acting out a particular behavior or just the arising of the personality view. So in something as subtle as that uh, metaphor earlier of the person driving down the street, they hear uh, some loud car noise and it triggers um, a traumatic response. Well, what happens? You know, there's the conscious attention. She hears, she makes contact with the sound. It's unpleasant. It's triggering. Uh, you know, it's it's very aversive and it's triggering this, uh, this sankaras related to an earlier accident, emotions and feelings of I'm not safe. Then there's the avijja, the ignorance of all that happening. And then boom, I fully believe now. Bam, I fully believe I'm unsafe. The world is unsafe. And I'm in that personality uh, structure. I'm in that ego state. I'm in that, that, um, that self view, as they would say. So this, that's just an example of kind of like how quickly, how rapidly uh, all of this is happening moment by moment, which is keep going around this wheel and this wheel and this wheel over and over again, as we're forming different selves. Now then how do I relate to that, the self that's arising now that then gives rise to the next? Well, there's this one view. So we have dependent origination. So each link, you know, we move up the links towards becoming. So there's this idea of dependent cessation. So we're following the blue lines where it's like, well, we're going back down, going back down. You know, if you can become awake at any of these stages, uh, you uh, quote, drop to the antecedent link, so to speak. It's like, here I am, I'm about to do something that, I, you know what, I really shouldn't be doing this right now. Oh my God, wow, I'm totally seeing that clearly wow, I'm really clinging to this idea here. I'm really feeling the compulsivity in the body. I'm really feeling like my heart rate and the anxiety. Ugh, boy, that's really unpleasant. You know, now I'm, I'm letting go of the directive. I'm letting go of the, the behavior associated. I'm, I'm letting go of the, the, the whole self-view around it. Now I'm just kind of feeling the unpleasantness there. I'm in contact with it. Now I'm, I, I've, allowed myself not to be born into that particular ego state, but just drop back into the senses, yeah? So this is some terms you'll hear in the Dharma of the unborn, the unoriginated, the deathless that talks about, you know, as we're, a, you know, we're, we're constantly moment by moment being thrust into this birth canal of becoming, but if we can clearly see it, then we can drop back into the senses and not necessarily um, reify a particular habit pattern of perception and behavior, yeah? Um, there's also this other way, uh, a couple of weeks ago, some of you might've been there. Um, this class I did on, uh, uh, dependent liberation, uh, talks about this other, um, way of looking. Um, let's see if I can bring that one up here. I believe that I got it right here. 
Okay, so right here, same thing. So we got the formations, consciousness, name and form, or you know, body, mind, sense, and base, feeling, craving, clinging, existence, birth, decay, and death, ignorance. So that's the way that they have it worded. But you know, the suffering that arises. Does the suffering that arise engender more suffering? We go through another round, or there's this way in which, well, this is a little off ramp and the exit route. Wholesome conduct, faith, wise attention. So this is something we'll revisit uh, in a bit. Wise attention, uh, yaniso manisakara is the term, uh, or turning the attention towards the womb. So we could look at what we was talking about earlier of the dependent cessation is one particular way where it's like, I'm kind of bringing my attention back to the womb of the moment where I'm not clinging upon anything. You know, that's the detaching from that, that volitional karmic thrust to continue on that path. You know, the wholesome conduct, you know, I'm, I'm in committed to uh, 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 um, restricting myself or uh, preventing myself from engaging in certain unskillful acts, you know, faith, uh, you know, that, that sense of trust within the practice. And then what happens here is it leads to this series of, how shall we say, um, uh, 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 mental factors, or we could even look at it as particular stages. You know, the concentration, happiness, tranquility, zest, joy, gladness. We could look at this as a particular way in which um, uh, Buddha is talking about uh, here. This is taken from the Upanishad Sutta. So talking about, well, engaging in jhana, deep states of concentration. And from there going into the Vipassana or the, the insight practice. And how then that can lead us to the revulsion, not in terms of disgust, but, oh, I'm clearly seeing this, this, this habit pattern, this um, uh, sankara, these asavas, these, uh, you know, th these habit patterns for what they are. And this is something that I don't want. There's no longer that, that siren song, that lull to engage, that lull to go unconscious to it, say yes and have it take over. I'm now uh, no longer interested in it. And I'm allowing that sensory event to pass away. And, you know, I've now kind of broken that karmic thrust, that karmic chain. I'm not reifying that habit pattern. Yeah. So that leads to the destruction of the mental influxes, the asavas there. So this is just a, a, a one particular way, or actually two particular ways, you know, the, the dependent origination that just by being wakeful, we can go through the dependent cessation and just observe how we drop down from our fixation to, well, the suffering ha is happening, but, you know, I can lean into the practice here and that can lead to the destruction of, so to speak. But either way, uh, there's, there's that theme. There's that theme of, um, you know, can we put, put this through the filter, the filter of uh, the practice, yeah? So I think it was the first class. You know, I talked a little bit about the, the three trainings, you know, sila samadhi panya or ethics, mindfulness and wisdom. Yeah. So this is idea of ethics. So looking at karma through this uh, lens of the three trainings on that level of the ethics or integrity, we can clearly see, oops, Sorry about that, let me click off of it, okay. On the level of ethics, we can clearly see our habit patterns of action, of perception, of volition, and we choose to refrain from the harmful ones, yeah? We choose to cultivate the skillful acts, yeah? So this is the, the sense of the volition and action. In terms of mindfulness, with our tools of introspection, you know, the shamatha that we can cultivate the calm and the ease, you know, I'm feeling the particular drivenness and compulsivity behind saying or doing something, you know, that's related to this habit pattern. Okay, well, the shamatha component of calming, if I can contact that aspect of practice, that takes the fire out, that takes the, the wind out of the sails, that is the cooling effect. You know, the vipassana, I bring that mindfulness component in, I can break the avijja. Oh, I'm no longer ignorant. I can see clearly, ooh, yeah, maybe... Maybe that's not the right thing to do. 
you know, with the metta practice, I can cultivate the greater capacity of the heart's ability to respond more effectively if something's unpleasant. Rather than falling into aversion, can I um, bring attention to uh, a sense of compassion towards whatever is unpleasant and hurtful? You know, if something is pleasant, can I have an appreciative joy? Just allow myself to enjoy that moment of pleasantness. You know, if something is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, can I not necessarily have a preference for any of them, but have this equanimity available for all? Yeah. And in doing so, you know, it increases this sense of wisdom. We can clearly see our intentions or the actions in a way that resolves our harmful karma. Yeah, so we can have that liberation from the samsaric uh, rebirth. Um, it was said in uh, one of the suttas uh, where, in, again, sometimes there's conflicting information, but there was one sutta uh, where a, a particular monk named Sati was going around telling the rest of the uh, Sangha that um, Buddha taught that consciousness is reborn. Yeah, so my consciousness is reborn from body to body to body. And the monks were, were telling this to Buddha and Buddha's like, oh no, I gotta set him straight. And he sits down, sits this guy Sati down and he says, no, uh, consciousness is dependent upon the body. When the body goes, consciousness goes. What is reborn is action. Yeah, so our actions are reborn. This is what it that perpetuates throughout. So that can look at, we can look at things a little bit wider than just our own little narrow sense of my own volition act in the fruit. But what's the actions that we were receiving? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Nagarjuna, in, in some of his writings, he talks about, uh, well, yeah, if there's, you know, this absolute interdependence, then really we can't, you know, everything is dependent upon something else. So we can't really say that there's any definitive cutoff point between A and B. So the way that I find that his conversations helpful is looking at, well, you know, for, for instance, intergenerational trauma, you know, the stuff that we didn't ask for that we've received. And now boom, here it is in our mind and body. What do we do it? Now it's our responsibility. Or even aside from intergenerational trauma, what things were you just born with that you didn't necessarily ask for? You know, your gender, your, your race, uh, your, um, socioeconomic place in the world, uh, you know, the family, um, uh, the family unit that you were born into, you know, so these are, these, there's all sorts of conditions that we're born into that we didn't necessarily ask for. Uh, and they all make strong imprints on us that we identify with. Um, so one way we can look at this idea of karma is it's our job it's our responsibility to resolve as much of this karmic thrust that we have been given that contributes to our pain so that we don't unconsciously just send it out there for the next person. You know, it's, it's, you know, so we can look at a lot of things that we didn't ask for that we're quite innocent about, but as adults, if we see that it's something that is giving us pain, we have to take that responsibility for it. And, you know, I like to look at, you know, that idea of liberation from samsaric rebirth as a call, uh, a call to us to resolve as much of our um, karmic pain as we can within our life, you know, so that we don't unconsciously just spew it out into the world, creating more conditions for other individuals. I mean, 2020, let's, <laughs> I mean, if anything, we're, we're looking at the pains of systems uh, in collision with each other, um, that just part of the what's broken down. Uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, "Oh my God, 2020 sucks! Can't wait till it's over." Do we really think 2021 is going to get better? You know, <laughs> this is you know all of this has been years, generations in the making. We're seeing it. You know, things clash together, uh, from overpopulation to um, you know uh, uh, what political identities are in control and what are their motives to actually help or harm people or help or harm themselves, how that's filtered down to the individual popul um, well, the individuals and also particular subgroups of the population that are distinctly feeling more 
um, uh, the pain, uh, literally some that are more prone to sickness and illness uh, that have uh, less access to resources. You know? And then you know, we see the, the, the very understandably and well-deserved anger that comes from that. And then all other forces that are in opposition because they have their conditions of, and their own ignorance and their own um, propensities towards domination and violence that are coming out and trying to silence. So we're, you know, we're, we're seeing just on this massive scale, all of these kind of lifetimes of like karmic thrusts coming together and kind of exploding right now. And how does that manifest in each one of us? How is all of this that's happening in the world happening for you right now? So this is part of your karma. And what type of self is coming up? You know, what is it? You know, so it can be very simple. That sense of here comes the sensory information, be it externally and uh, exogenous or endogenously created, either from the outside or generated from our minds. And then it creates a, a, a change, a shift in how we see and how we view and how we feel. And then without knowing it, another self has arisen and is now driving, is now speaking. And so this is a lot of what we're, we're looking at. Uh, you know, I, I originally gave this metaphor of, you know, the Abhidhamma, it's kind of like the, the chef tasting the soup and is like able to say like, oh yeah, there's, you know, okay, there's probably, a, you know, little, too much paprika, too much salt, uh, not enough cream, you know, and then you can add and subtract accordingly, you know. So that idea of can we just kind of sample experience this mind body and notice, okay, maybe I'm having a little too much aversion, maybe a little too much impulsivity, maybe a little too much fixation on certain um, uh, 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 ideas or beliefs of me being a victim or, you know, my own kind of rage that wants to come out. You know, I'm able to kind of taste that. And maybe there's not enough kind of self-forgiveness. Maybe there's not enough just ability to have compassion towards my pain and the ability to cool down some of that fire a little bit. You know? Okay, can we kind of shift and change that? Just that ability to be able to see clearly, understand, have those tools available, you know, that's what is subtly giving us that possibility, that potential to really kind of work towards our karmic roots and begin to kind of break, you know, uproot avijja sankara, uproot a lot of these deeply seated habits of pain that show up as an I am in a particular world. Yeah. So this is uh, part of this idea of like karma and rebirth that are just so intimately intertwined uh, that are really, I think, kind of at the heart of what we're being asked for if we are to under, undertake um, the path of the Dharma. How is it that we can resolve as much as we can um, you know, our karmic pains within this lifetime? So thank you for, for uh, paying attention to, to, to that. I know that that was a, a rather dense one going through dependent origination and karma. But before we go into a sit, um, any questions or, or reflections anybody would like to, to have? I know there was a lot of material we covered. Just feel free to unmute yourself and manifest. Mike? Hey, Swati. Hi. Uh, it seems like um, all this uh, realization of non-self, the impermanence of self and dependent origination, all that is really talking about a certain non-attachment uh, to the self and also to the idea of having permanence, uh, some independent entity that's there for us. Um, so my question is, you know, like we talked about, like when you showed the dependent or origination, it focuses on uh, the habits or the mental patterns that we have that are destructive. And we are talking about not being attached to them to be able to see them clearly. Mm -hmm. And then in some sort of objective fashion, we are working on removing them. And as a result, in some sense, every moment we are getting reborn in that sense. Mm -hmm. So what about the 
mental habits or patterns that are constructive. The mental that habits work, that are constructive? Constructive that work for us. It could be caring about others, compassion, sympathetic joy, all these Brahma Viharas. Is it okay to be attached to those? Yeah. Well, that's a that's a that's a good question. So within that formulation of that 12 links of dependent origination, you know, it's kind of like a self-born of suffering because there's that, you know, that that thirst, that craving that leads to the clinging. Yeah. Whereas when you're if you're talking about, you know, deeply cultivating the Brahma Viharas, deeply cultivating um, perceptions and behaviors around compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity, kindness. Um, there's not necessarily that attachment per se born of a thirst, born of, of dukkha. Yeah. So it's like, you know, sometimes that sense of dukkha translated as suffering, a, a, a way that I, I feel makes sense to me is there's that gap between how things are and how I, how I want things to be. So it's just like, oh, why can't things just be like, uh, you know, that's that thirst. That's that I want things to be different. Uh, and there's that suffering that's within that. And so there's that kind of attachment fixation. Whereas what I'm hearing you say is like, well, you know, in cultivating, um, you know, these deeply ingrained habits that are more uh, liberative in nature, um, I, I don't know if attachment would necessarily be the word in, in the Buddhist context so much as, you know, cultivation, you know, the more deeply that they're cultivated, they become a second nature response. So just like, um, uh, um, you know, when I was younger, uh, uh, a second nature response would be a, a fly or a mosquito would land on me. The second nature response would be to me to be slapped, you know, <laughs> That was, that's what I was taught. Oh, a bug, yuck, gross. It has germs, wants to do bad things to you, slap. And it becomes the second nature response. But like within that, there's so much like perception, aversion, yuck, you know, then the dependent origination manifests in slap, yeah? As opposed to, um, you know, a deep cultivation. So there's kind of that non-arising of that. And, and there's something about that abiding in that, in the senses there. And, and it's like the, having that capacity for meta, um, you know, ships that. So let's say that the mosquito or the fly lands on me, maybe there might be that subtle, it doesn't feel really comfortable, but the second nature response now is to kind of like bring some ease to my own pain. Yeah. So I guess I, I look at it more as like, how deeply do we cultivate these habits so that's what arises as a second nature response, as opposed to a habit based on like an attachment to something suffering oriented? Am, am, am yeah, I yeah, talking around yeah. what you're looking for? Yes, yes. No, I, I, I get exactly what you're saying. Uh, can I just say this, that the attachment to even metta or even the positive practices um, attachment by that, I mean, craving for the pleasantness of it hmm. without really checking the reality also can lead to suffering. Oh, yes, of for course. A, for example, you know, the mosquito example that you gave, if we allowed the, mex, uh, the mosquito to bite us anytime, yes. it chance, and if you are in India, you could get malaria or dengue. So, yes. <laughs> So in other words, you know, even that to a certain degree is to be examined. Yes. Yeah. And in so, that sense, attachment uh, do, I mean, does come in even when it is too pleasant or something that we think about as positive experience. Yeah. So like anything that arises in, in consciousness is potentially subject to craving aversion, even to like the pleasant states of mind where... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that happens to some people. They might be able to reach a point in their practice where they could really get into yummy states of metta or yummy states of concentration, and then they kind of get cling to it, you know? Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. There can be a particular suffering of needing to cling to that. Okay, I think I understand a little bit more clearly what you're talking about there, for sure. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Swati, are you, uh, when 
I was imagining people that are chasing what they had in their, in their best meditation experience. Mm. Like, is that what you mean by people that are relying on an expected outcome of meditation and clinging to that? That, that, uh, that too, that too, but I'm also thinking about if let's say, for example, compassion, which is, uh, uh, could be an empowering, freeing and a positive experience. But if we don't examine it, in fact, it could create certain suffering to others and to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So compassion, for example, if we we could be imposing it on other people when they don't need it. I mean, that's an example of, or maybe we are doing it in a way that doesn't respect uh, what our boundaries are. Mm -hmm. So these are examples of attachment to even the positive patterns or destruct, I mean, constructive, so-called constructive emotions Mm -hmm. could lead us to suffer. Mm -hmm. So I'm just talking about how why non-attachment, I mean, what I'm just examining what non-attachment exactly would mean. Sure. So yeah, all these things that you're spotlighting here, um, you know, I, that's quite widespread people being attached to and having unskillful um, expressions of compassion, et cetera. So I think, you know, when they talk about the three, uh, you know, the three jewels, uh, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Sangha being the community, how there's that importance to having community. And another way to put that is it's important um, to have some spiritual friends around that can give you some honest, candid feedback too. Uh, you know, so they talk about, you know, the importance of having a teacher that you trust that can give you feedback, but also just your peers uh, that can also give some candid feedback too about whether or not we're having a, a skillful expression of our practice or a non-skillful one. Sure. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, quick question as well. Yeah. Um, yes, I kind of had a question, um, a point of clarification on um, kind of the role of ignorance in, um, in karma. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems, it seems to me like, um, like your example with the ant was, um, was easy to follow, but it seems like there's a lot of, you know, you know, systems that we uphold, um, in addition to, you know, you know, whatever it is, stopping out the ants that are more maybe engaging passively or w- even with good intentions. And it seems like, um, you know, you look at like the broader effects of capitalism or systemic racism, and there are these kind of like, like all these, you know, multiplying effects of our actions that are creating you know, these, these really important set of, kind of downstream consequences and kind of what is the role of those in karma? Because it seems like you can be like a totally happy, you know, good vibes person and so be causing a lot of harm in a kind of corrupt system. Yeah, uh, that's an excellent point. I mean, are, are you familiar with uh, The Good Place TV show? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for people that, that are, are not, that's it, kind of along the lines of, of, of one of the, the plot points in that show too, was uh, for anybody that's not familiar with the show, it's a, it's a fun series. It's really excellent. They, they have a really good way of kind of looking at some of these questions. And, and one, one point that Cole brought up was, you know, it, you know, the idea is you die, there's a good place, there's a bad place. It's not really heaven or hell, but the, those are kind of the metaphors. And apparently after a certain year, nobody's ever gotten into the good place. And when they started to kind of open up the books and look at it, they're kind of pointing to what Cole is pointing at. It's just like, well, you know, back in the day, this person went out and got his mother flowers. So therefore they got some good karma points. But now a, a person goes out and does the same thing. Well, what do they do? They have this horrible karmic in a uh, footprint by driving somewhere. They're supporting all of this like capitalistic, uh, uh, you know, vulture capitalism that is, you know, squashed and repressed other uh, countries. And so even in somebody wanting to have a good act is still kind of supported and um, uh, 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 allowed to perpetuate a lot of kind of harmful things that are happening globally. And that is an incredibly huge, a good point there, Cole, because I, I mean, it's just like, here I am talking about generating good karma and, you know, I've got an iPhone that, you know, Foxconn, how many employees have jumped out of the windows and commit suicide? Uh, you know, uh, they want it, you know, rather than, I don't know. <laughs> There's so many things I can point about in the room that I, through my own 
having here is kind of generating some bad global karma. Um, it's a it's a really good question, you know. It's just like what what is the answer for us to just kind of go and seal ourselves off in a cave, and try <laughs> to just kind of live off of whatever dewdrops come. So I think there's. there's I think some... I think the. Uh huh. I, mean, I think the Buddhist uh, Buddha's answer to that would be to understand emptiness. Mm -hmm. That even the things that we think are good today may or may not be good tomorrow or in other contexts. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to not having attachment to any of these things. Like I'm, I'm so much better because this is what I believe in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so much better because this is what I believe in for sure. But I think there's, the, there's, there's, um, you, you know, I, I think that, th that that's a, a really good question uh, about just our actions. Even if we're trying to do good actions, ultimately, what, what are they supporting? And reinforcing and I think that all of us have our own areas that we're trying to make a difference and I think that it's important uh, for that that balance of of practice and service so at least you know that service you know can help us become a little bit more awake and aware of like what things we can change within within our own lives whether that's just the, the micro uh, changes of decisions we make versus, you know, on what levels do we want to step out into society and try to exact change. And as we're doing that, even in the act of trying to do good in the world, are we doing some harm within that too? You know, um, I can kind of go off on that a little bit too, but uh, these are excellent questions, but I definitely want to reserve time so we can actually do a little bit of sitting. So. Um, Maybe uh, we can uh, put a pause on, on the discussion. We can re revisit on, on the back end, yeah? Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody. Allow yourselves to come to a comfortable upright position. Allow yourself to straighten up and settle in. Settling into posture, finding a place of relative comfort. And settling into our sense of awareness, whatever that brightness, aliveness of the mind and body, you can contact that. And settle into that experience. You can begin to open up towards the breath, anchoring your attention onto a part of the body actively engaged in breathing, be that the nose, throat, lungs, belly. We start off by cultivating a little bit of shamatha, the calming, cooling, concentration, supporting. And not merely paying attention to the entering and exiting of air, but what are the pleasant qualities that arise from breath? And first half of the breath, any pleasant hedonic tones, qualities of energy, just the oxygen pleasure of getting air needs being met. Allow yourself to discern and feel the pleasant.
And on that second half of the breath, the out-breath and the base of the out-breath, what are the pleasant calming qualities available there? The relaxation response, the relinquishing release, letting go, emptying out, contentment, peace, whatever it is for you. Just notice it and appreciate it. So we can open up this scope of focus to include this full body, the various sensations that rise and fall within the body. And if it's available, sometimes just this awareness of spaciousness. And whether we're hearing the sounds outside that may give us a sense of the space around us or a sense of proprioception where the body is in space, the mind may map together the environment. So we have this breath taking place within this body. It's taking place within the spaciousness. You can allow yourself to just free float between breath, body, and space.
from time to time we may be hanging out. Noticing the breath, the body sensation, the spaciousness. And from time to time, the mental sankharas exert themselves. The images that arise and see space, the internal talk that arises and hear space. Maybe certain emotions, impulses, sensations that are triggered also by thought, fantasy, planning, daydream. So notice this, notice this activity of seeing, hearing, feeling as it occurs. And if you can see it clearly, it's just a sensory event that rises and passes. But maybe that some might arise that have a particular charge to them. Something might be particularly pleasant or unpleasant. It begins to trigger another wave of seeing, hearing, feeling, and then before you know it, you're caught in a fantasy plan or daydream where there's a definitive sense of self engaged in a definitive expression of world. So we can notice moment by moment how even by sitting doing nothing, all of these different selves want to emerge, all these different habit patterns. So hang out in breath, body, space, but notice whatever see, hear, or feel happens. It has a charge that wants to take you down the rabbit hole. Notice when you do fall into a fantasy plan daydream, what's that theme there? Is that the first time that your mind is going there? Or is there a particular familiarity of that theme? Notice the familiarity of that particular feeling or that particular opinion, self view that arises. And then waking up within that, you notice yourself just falling back, the dependent cessation as you're releasing that grip and just coming back into abiding the senses.
release everybody. Post bell practice, allowing yourself to stay uh, open to receiving what you've generated. And notice that that habit of whatever self you wants to pop in and take over from the meditating self. Just notice that transition. So what did you notice? What did you observe? What was what was salient for you in your practice this evening? And of course, any questions on any of the material that we covered thus far, just feel free to unmute yourself and manifest. I, I have a question. I don't know. Oh, it's like a weird one for me or just like an experience I had in my meditation. Well, I don't know. It seems like weirdly simple to have the answer to it, but I'm like sitting there kind of, I think early on and I am caught up in like a pleasant memory, a past pleasant memory and that, and I noticed that and I'm like, oh, okay. And there's always like a little shame, like, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. I should be like focusing on the meditation. I'm like aware of that. I'm like, oh, just like, you know, but then I sort of like, I wondered like, what's wrong with me hanging out in that pleasant memory? Is there anything like karmically like, because mm -hmm. if I'm not necessarily clinging, if I'm just enjoying the pleasant memory, is that something that's inherently wrong because I'm missing out on something that's happening here and now? Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that, that the question that goes with? That's, that's, just, that's the question, yeah. Is there anything wrong with hanging out in a pleasant memory? Well, I guess it depends on the, the lens that you're looking through. Um, you, you know, oh, let's see. I guess, I guess the, the short answer is it depends. You know, if, you know, in that idea of like the chef tasting the soup, if it's just like, oh my God, you know, there's so much kind of like sadness and drudgery going around it. Oh, wow, I'm just connecting with a happy memory and I'm aware that my heart is opening and there's some pleasantness going on. Maybe it's good to just kind of reinforce those neural pathways that are related to, you know, uh, contacting happy memories and there's a, a happy self that's arising. You know, there's definitely some, um, there's definitely benefit to that for sure. You know, uh, a lot of times when people are, are depressed or, or or really anxious, you know, they they, they give, um, whether consciously or unconsciously, too much of a, a, a permission for all of those like negative thoughts to come to the forefront and kind of influence the weather inside. So sometimes it's about, oh, how can we get people to cultivate, you know, you know, some of these neural pathways related to like positivity. Uh, to extend that into kind of more uh, Buddha oriented talk. So within the metta practice, a lot of times in metta, it's like, oh, can you bring to mind a, a loved one or uh, a teacher or a benefactor to get that sense of, of kindness or metta going? Maybe by extension, maybe it doesn't have to be a particular person. Maybe it could be a pleasant memory as long as the heart is responding in that way. And then if we can then drop into the body and feel what is arising in the heart and take that as, as an object of focus as well. Then sometimes that might be a two pronged contact because one part is contacting the activity of the mind that's then generating what's going on in the body and being able to like benefit from that and cultivate from that. So that, that would be you know a, a way that you can skillfully, mindfully uh, be generating a, a sense of kindness or joy or what have you by, you know, being able to um, cultivate, let's say, uh, Tanisaru Bigo talks about sometimes using sankaras to fight sankaras, you know? So it's just like, I'm consciously bringing up a positive memory to fill the body with metta and joy in order to maybe, you know, suppress or kind of eradicate some other negative habit patterns. So there's definitely an argument for something good about that. Now, then it depends also, because if let's say you're going into the meditation and your goal or the or what you want to practice is not attaching to any thought at all or you want to abide in emptiness or you know uh, see through the activity of mind and not necessarily identify or fuel any thought and you find yourself going into fantasy planning daydream then you're kind of subverting you know your goal in a way so 
No, I think I think it depends. You know, there's definitely an argument to be said for you know the good that can happen in terms of being able to use that as a way to to uh, skillfully cultivate some positivity. But if your goal is to, you know, uh, uh, be kind of awake, aware without thought, and not fueling thoughts and such like that, and maybe if it's a habit pattern around escapism or entertainment that you might want to refrain from, and you find yourself doing it, then may maybe it's not, um, you know, moving you towards that goal. So I think it's kind of context dependent. Or if you're like going into those memories. I think I just sort of had like to like, cause you're like bored because you're avoiding whatever's going on in the meditation, you know, and I yeah. think, or, or there's some kind of discomfort with the present, um, which I think happens to me a lot in my, in my practice. So you're bored with the present or you might feel something uncomfortable and you might go to like fantasy or yeah. memory. Yeah. Or I have like, you know, there's some like fun yeah yeah or there's just some memory that seems a lot more um enjoyable you know than sitting than sitting and focusing on my breath I think that like and I and and even though I know even though my intention is to very much focus on and do with the meditation listen to your words of like you know I find myself kind you know kind of being pulled in that direction for sure um, so. so that that's good to know that habit pattern because I know that my myself when I go on retreat there, the, the habit pattern of craving for entertainment definitely comes up. And I can sit there with my breath and be present with the dullness of my mind and the excruciating pain in my right hip, or this pleasant fantasy memory just is like, just kind of, you know, kind of go unconscious to this and it'll all go away. You know, so like th that, then that's a pernicious trap for sure. So we should definitely be aware of that if that's a uh, particular craving based, uh, you know, craving unconscious combination, you know, so those hindrances are coming up. So if it's like, oh, I'm consciously going to think about this to help generate meta, good. If it's like, no, my, my goal is to be present with the mind body experience and be with breath, but then this habit pattern of craving and unconsciousness or like saying, oh, come on over here, it'll be a lot more fun then yeah, then, then it gets a little dangerous for sure. Yeah. Mike, could I ask a question about yeah, the, sure. the talk you just gave on the, the karmic uh, rebirth circle? Mm -hmm. um, at the end, there was, um, you, you focused on ignorance and there was um, this uh, blossoming upward. Um, um, I wrote in my notes, um, ignorance, suffering, wake up. And then there was a flow of things. So the question is, is that a kind of mapping of the process of the possibilities or thing uh, or states that open up as you're releasing deep samskara? That's a, that's an excellent question for sure. Um, so it can be taken in, in a couple different interpretations. We can look at it through the lens of like Buddha was giving a, a directive about no, can we take that object of suffering and use it as an object of focus and meditate on it through like the jhanas, you know, where you kind of penetrate so deep into it so that, and maybe this is kind of going towards you're talking about, like, you know, when we kind of see through it, then yeah, there's this unleashing of this kind of like, you know, nuclear power then that can be transmuted into joy, uh, uh, you know, love, uh, what, what is in the list, uh, you know, zest, zeal, concentration, all of these like deeper jhanic factors that can help induce deeper concentration. And then, you know, uh, then it goes into uh, um, clear vision and knowledge. Well, maybe as we're meditating on it and it can maybe go away for a little bit, there's that burst of that energy that can be recycled, you know, recycling the reactions. But then maybe, you know, that, that habit pattern is suppressed a little bit, but maybe it wants to come up again, but there's such a deep um, kind of concentration that's happening now. And there's that potential for that Vipassana, the seeing through that we could really see it being born at its roots that we're kind of cutting it off. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we can look at it in terms of like a Buddhist kind of prescribing kind of a paint by numbers, step by step. This is how you take it and put it through this process. Or maybe what you're suggesting of maybe that's kind of like reflecting of like an organic experience of, oh, yeah, I'm waking up. And within that, there's this spontaneous upsur uh, upwelling 
of, of these like positive mental factors that can happen that lead to just kind of an ever deepening um, liberative experience. So I, I think it could be both. Yeah. But what, what, what do you feel? What's your sense of it? I was thinking that it might be a sort of map of um, once you begin the, the letting go process, although the Jonic states, my understanding from Lee Brassington's uh, working with him is there's a self there all the way through at least the sixth Jonic state. So that once you, you would have to go to knowledge and knowledge and is that vision? Is that what? Um, that something has to break out then to the the freedom right mm -hmm. the no self for that to be um a, a map of any kind i just hadn't i'd seen the circle but i hadn't seen that upswelling and i'm sitting here looking at it and thinking zest that's tranquility happiness concentration mm -hmm. uh, and i hadn't seen them as um related states um in in a process before Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that way. So something to be yeah. curious about. Uh, yeah, that, that, that'd be very cool to kind of um, check that against the, the Brasington work you did. But there's, there's all, even though there's a self uh, all the way through, you know, the, the latter ends of the Arupa jhanas, they also do talk about, you know, you know, at any point you can kind of dip out of the jhana and go into the insight work as well. You know, and they, a lot of times I hear classically kind of like the between four and five is like a good kind of time to like step out and in, into the insight work as well. But um, no, I, I, I like the way that you're thinking there, Kenshin, for sure. Just, okay. just fun idea. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, I got one eye on the time. So I want to make sure everyone's released into the wilds for sure. Um, so thank you everybody for your, your time and um, uh, uh, and attention this evening. Um, so many of us uh, have kind of paid for a series or a single class and thank you for that. Um, your, your donations, your Donna practice uh, allows Inside LA to continue to keep its virtual doors open and continue to offer programming. Uh, howsoever, no one will ever be turned away for a lack of funds. Uh, you know, I, I personally feel that uh, the uh, or abide by the, the adage of the, the Dharma uh, is freely offered um, in situations like this. Uh, so uh, if finances are an issue, uh, please come and practice with us anyway. However, if you are in a position that you can contribute a, a little more, that will definitely help uh, as we are enduring this sustained period of economic uncertainty that we are all being subject to. Uh, so let me see if I can uh, find those links. Um, to give to people. Um, accordingly, uh, so you can go to the um, Insight LA page uh, and here we go. Hopefully this is the correct one. And um, follow this if you want to uh, offer some Donna there. I put that in the chats to everybody. Um, also, uh, I want to invite everybody here uh, uh, mornings, if y'all are free between 9, 9 to 10 a.m. Um, I have a lovely uh, morning sit group uh, each morning. We focus on a different uh, theme of practice, but it, uh, again, that is something that is open to everybody there. So there's a Zoom link. Feel free to copy and paste that. Um, that's about that. So uh, thank you everybody uh, for all of your work and your uh, considering of the topic today. And it was a dense one. So thank you everybody for coming along on the ride and allow us to end with a dedication of merit. By the merits of these acts and other such virtues, may we attain a liberation for the benefit of all sentient beings. We bow before those who have come before us on the path and to those who will come after us. Thank you everybody have yourselves a wonderful week hope to talk to you next week thank you